Hey everybody, today Rado runs through The King's Abbey, which is a worker placement game that's on Kickstarter right now that I'm going to be doing a run through today, so you might decide whether it's a game you would want to back. And I'll be doing it as a two player run through today. I am the green player over here, Jen is the blue player, and in this game, players are. Well, we're in the Middle Ages, or I should say just about the end of the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, are coming to a close. And the king of the land has tasked us, we being simple scholarly monk types, has tasked us with the job of helping to improve the local abbey. I mean, there is a king's abbey at the beginning of the game. Actually, I should say, Jen and I both have one. And it's our job over the course of seven rounds to build up this abbey and um, you know, basically help pull the kingdom out of darkness. Over the course of the game, the darkness of the Dark Ages, of the Middle Ages, is going to be a constant threat that you know will potentially bring all the people of the region down and, and you know lead to ruin and despair. And it's our job to fight against that by building up the King's Abbey. And so that's what I'm going to be doing today. And let's see, at the beginning of the game, Everybody gets one random building that they get to add on to their abbey. I ended up with a cloister, or I should say building card. Some, sometimes they're separate buildings, sometimes they're additions to the abbey. But anyway, I've got a cloister, and Jen's got a garden. We also, at the beginning of the game, start with two peasants who have basically committed themselves to the King's Abbey. One of them works, actually, in our starting building, and one of them is sitting over here in the pews, waiting to work his way up so that he can become baptized, so that, well, so that he can improve his lot in life. Also, the, the Abbey itself represents a defense against what the game calls the darkness. And the darkness is kind of like this abstraction of all the bad stuff of the Dark Ages. Plague and ignorance and despair and poverty and you know crime and all the bad stuff is you know is referred to collectively as the darkness and as we build up our abbey and make it better and more glorious and and we you know improve everybody's lot in life our defense climbs and we need to keep our defense climbing because if our, at, during a given round at the end of the round if our defense doesn't equal the current level of darkness well we will lose victory points which nobody wants to do and at the beginning of the game in the first round the darkness equals three although if you want you can actually set the game to be a little bit tougher by starting on this spot because if this spot the, at the end of the game, the darkness will be up to 8. With this one, the darkness will be up to 9. So we're going to play the normal game where instead of playing it with the slightly harder thing by starting it here. So at the end of this round, we have to make sure our defense is at least three or we start losing victory points and people. The people who have you know, devoted their lives to following us will basically die or well, at least will be gone because of the darkness that we must keep fighting. Now at the beginning of the game, I've got a slight advantage because my defense is actually at 2 because my manned cloister you know, because I've got this, uh, this peasant here working the cloister, it has increased our defense against the darkness. No doubt because the cloister is beautiful and it's a wonderful place for the peasants and the people to come and reflect about their lot in life and it inspires them. I mean, that's actually one of the really cool things about this game is there are lots of ways to fight against the ignorance and poverty and all that stuff that is rampant in the Middle Ages. And a beautiful cloister is one of them. All right. Jen, meanwhile, she has a garden and that means she can produce more food every round than me because, you know, in this game, you got to feed your people. I mean, if you have the flock who has come and devoted themselves, well, you know, they're going to pay you with a tithe so you can make some income, but you've got to take care of them by feeding them. And Jen can generate more food than me because she's got a garden. All right, we also, like I said, we start with four bucks, one wood, one grain, and one grain can feed up to four people, and one stone. And no sand, but we'll need some of that too if we're going to build any of these buildings that have popped up. And, you know, these are just randomly shuffled out of these decks and dealt at the beginning of the game. So that's the situation. The last thing we got to do as part of setup is we got to roll to see who goes first. So let's go ahead and roll. I am green, Jen is blue, and I got a two, Jen got a six. Low number wins, so I am the first player. I will take the first player marker, and that means I start with five points, and Jen starts with six to make up for the fact that I am first. Okay, oh, and also in a two player game, uh, I'm just using cubes from a different player color. Some of the worker placement spaces are blocked off to tighten the board a little bit. Okay. Great. We are set up, ready to go. Let's start building the King's Abbey. All right, so the first thing we do, there's a nice little, so everybody gets a nice little one of these summary sheets that walks you through the 12 phases of every round. And this game takes place over seven rounds. The first thing we do in a round is we roll our dice. Like I said up front, I am a monk. 
a simple, humble monk trying to help build up the Abbey and to fight, fight against the darkness. But I've got nine other monks, represented by these nine dice, who are going to help me achieve my goal. So let's roll and see what my monks are up to this turn. Alrighty, and I'll just go ahead and pull them out here because I've got to roll Jen's monks as well. D -d -d -d. And Jen rolls hers. Of course, everybody does it at the same time, unless you only have one hand. All right, so there we go. Here's Jen's workforce and my workforce. All right, so we've done the first thing. We've rolled the dice. And we can start thinking of, uh, about, because, you know, different... That one of the things nice about this game is high numbers have a use, as do... Oops, this was a two. As do low numbers. And it looks like I've got a fairly nice... Actually, I've got one of each. I've got all through one of the six. I've got something of everything. That's pretty nice. Let's see how Jen did. She's got a one, a couple of twos, and let's see. Oh, three fives. Wow. A three, a six, and a four. Actually, see, so yeah, rolling nine dice, you have a lot of options as a usual rule. Oh, I forgot to mention one more thing as part of setup. We each of us got, we drew one card randomly from the Crusade deck. So I've got a, a relatively tough Crusade that I could go on because one of the things I can do, my workers can do all kinds of stuff. They can um, basically help convert the local populace so that we get more seats in the pews, which means we can get more baptized. They can help me train myself because I start out as a monk, but I can work my way up to friar and deacon and, and I, you know, I can work my way up to bishop and priest and all that stuff. So I can use my dice for that. I can use these dice to go out into the fields and collect grain or wood or stone or sand. I can use these guys to directly fight the darkness. Remember how I was saying at the end of the round we have to have three? I could just take one of these dice, any of these dice, and put it here. And now for this round, my defense is up to three. Or I could send um, some of these monks off to the Crusades. Now this Crusade card I drew is a four of a kind. Which means I have to put four monks with the same number on their matching. So right off the bat, if I want to, I could take um, th these three ones and I could slap them all down here. Um, well, actually, wait a minute. But, but I'm, jumping, I'm jumping the gun a bit. So we've rolled. That's the first thing we do. The second thing we do, before we actually get to place any workers, uh, any of these monks, we draw the event card. There are going to be seven events over the course of the game, and you build the event deck right up front. Now this deck has seven cards, two... I forget what they're called. Two good cards, two bad cards, and three terrible cards. The really terrible ones are the Vikings. Let's see what we got if we get a good or a bad one right up front. Okay, actually, we got a Vikings. And there's a special rule. The very, very first round of the game, if you draw Vikings, uh, you say, uh-uh, because -uh, Vikings are so bad, we don't deal with them in the first round. Let's draw again. Okay, we got a Year of Plenty. This is one of the two good cards. Now, the Viking card goes to the bottom of the deck. So we now know for a fact that the final round of this game is going to have Vikings, because we just put it there. So that's something we can plan for at the end of the game. But anyway, so we are going to have a Year of Plenty. There's, Like I said, there's two good cards in here, and this is one of them. Uh, each player receives one of each resource. Well, that is a wonderful start. Okay, so everybody gets basically an additional. That, that is a good boon. And hey, we even have some sand. All right. So hooray for the year of plenty. Okay. But again, it could have been just easily been bad. It could have been one of the uh, disaster cards like plague or rats or whatever. But anyway, so. We've drawn an event, and it was a good event, and it was good. Let's move on. Number three. Now, we start doing our Abbey dice placement. Actually, to go through all the, And that means we place our workers in and around the Abbey. We can put them to work in the Abbey. We can send them off from Crusades. We can put them um, to work fighting against the darkness. And now, the thing is, I've got nine dice here. I'm not, I'm, you know, there are two phases. Step number three and step number five um, when we place dice. So I'm going to place some of them in and around the Abbey now, but later on in the round, I'm going to save some of them because I'm also going to place some out in the fields to work. Which is kind of an idea that if you if you played Viticulture, it has that notion of a worker placement game where the workers get placed in two different phases. So you have to save some. So first, we're going to place some workers in the Abbey. Then we have the opportunity to purchase car building cards. Then we place workers out in the fields that we didn't put in the Abbey. Then we get to move peasants as they get closer and closer to being baptized. Then we get to build the buildings we've bought or the uh, uh, the add-ons to the Abbey itself, like the gate tower or the bell tower. Or the chapel. Then we harvest 
if we have, like in Jen's case, she will harvest because she has a garden. I don't. And actually, it should say here harvest and feed because after we harvest, before we move on to step nine, we have to feed all the followers of our flock, you know, all, all the members of our flock. Then, step nine, we combat the darkness and then the darkness moves forward. And then, 10, we get income. 11, we, if we completed a crusade, we get the rewards from that. And then we can start new crusades. And then finally, we get ourselves ready for the next round. That's the whole big deal. So, We've had an event happen. Now let's start placing some dice. And like I was saying up front, um, this was really nice. I got three of a kind here. I'm thinking I'm going to send these guys off to work in the Crusades. And I have almost finished this Crusade card. Now, whenever you send your guys off, they have to be accompanied by a peasant. You know, basically like a, what would you call it? A, a squire, I guess, or a page. So, I have one peasant at the ready who has devoted himself to the church. You know, he's a member of our congregation. So, he will come along with these three monks to go off to the Crusades. Now, when I finish these Crusades, there's six points, some stone, and another bag. Bags are really useful. I, I forgot to mention, we start with one bag and one wagon. But I could get myself a second bag when I complete that crusade, and that's a big deal. But unfortunately, I didn't get any more ones, so it's going to have to wait. Although, if I look over here, I can see Jen's got a one. And one of the cool elements of this game is, you know, while it, you know, it is a worker placement game, and uh, you're, for the most part, tending to your own garden um, you know, with, with your worker placement, you do have opportunities to coordinate with other players. What I could do is I could say, man, if I just had one more one, because it has to be a one, it has to be four of a kind, I could finish the Crusades this round and get these rewards. But I don't have any. But I could say to Jen, hey, honey pie. Honey pie, would you help me? Because Jen could con could commit her guy to my crusade. Now she herself would also have to put a a serf in, you know, a peasant. But that means that hey, I would get to finish the crusade. And now this is basically a negotiation element because I can say, hey, honey, you know, if you come and help me with this crusade, I'll give you the stone. Um, you know, and I, I'll keep the bag and the uh, six points for myself. And Jen says, uh-uh, that's, I, I only have, I, I have to give up my only surf to help you. It'd be more than that. Tell you what, I'll do it for the stone and the bag. And you can keep the six points. I'm like, ah, but I really want that bag because the bags are a, a means you have to be able to manipulate your dice rolls. Because every bag you have, you can increase the value of one die. You can turn a two into a three or whatever. And I'd say, no, 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 you can't have the bag. But tell you what, I'll give you the stone and one point of the six points I've got. And she says, so, okay, a stone and two points and you've got it. And I say, ooh, okay, I'll do it. And so Jen, you know, because we are placing our workers at the same time, Jen will go on ahead and place one of her workers on mine. She also has to commit a, uh, uh, a peasant. And so, hooray, I've actually finished it. Although, we've struck a deal. I'm going to have to give Jen this stone and two points. Let's Hopefully, I remember that before the round is over. But anyway, let's now continue with our worker placement. Now, that is one of the places we could um, send workers. You know what? And Jen, by the way, she, I just know she's got three fives. What the heck? She's going to send her three fives over here. <gasps> oh. But by giving up that peasant, Jen doesn't have a peasant anymore, so she can't do her own. Wow. You know what? I didn't realize that. Jen says, you know what? Because... If I'm sending my peasant off to your crusade, I can't do my own crusade. I'm going to need three points, chump. I'm like, ah, three points. But, I, but here's the thing. If Jen doesn't help me with this, these guys are going to be locked up. I'm not going to get to use them for anything else this round or the next round because they're just going to be off in the crusades. So I don't want them to be locked up forever. That'll be a real pain. So I say, OK, honey pie, you strike a tough bargain, but you'll get the stone and three points. And she says, OK. Because three points for one monk that's a great return. Okay, so, so, but it cost me half the points I'm going to get plus my stone. Oh, but I held on to the bag. Honey, would you have actually gone for that? Jen just walked by. Would you have gone for that deal? No, I would have done my own. Jen, Jen would have said, "Heck with that! Screw your damn crusade!" Yeah, because because it, it, you know, it's helping me a lot. Well, I mean, what would I have to offer then for you to help me out here? Ooh. See, it's a bag and a stone. Jen just walked by. Uh, I don't think I would have done it this turn at all. I'm really? Sure. Even if even for a bag? This is the first round. You'd have that bag oh. for the rest of the game. Okay, three points in the bag. Three points in the bag. You would accept nothing less than three points in the bag. Yep, because the, otherwise... The stone and guys. four points. No, the bag. The, nothing else. 
And three points. All right, folks, you heard it here. Well, I will go with that. That okay. Jen is really mean. All right, so I have to give her th no two, two points, points. Two good. points. Three points in the bag. Two points in the bag. Otherwise, you've got three men committed for a whole turn. Right. That's an awful lot. Wow. All right, three points in the bag. <laughs> the deal is struck. You want to shake on hand, on camera? All right, deal is struck. Wow. All right. <laughs> I should not have uh, actually had the real Jen come and negotiate because she did a much better job than the virtual Jen. All right, because I was really, I mean, now I didn't have to commit these guys at all. I mean, but then I'm not working on the crusade and you really do want to keep your crusades going because they are a source of a lot of income. But anyway, so I will get a stone though. That's a big deal. A stone is worth four bucks. So, all right, I'm not complaining too much. But anyway, so Jen's done that. Now that means Jen cannot commit to her own crusade. So she's put that on hold, but she got something good for it. Now let's keep on working about worker placement. Now, like I said, I could take some of these guys and put them up here on the wall, but I am hoping that during the build phase, I'm going to build something that will increase my defenses. So I'm not going to do any of that. So the other place I can put my workers is over here. I can put one, twos, and threes over here, and I can put four, fives, and sixes over here. Um, I'll go on ahead and I'll put a two and a three here. Now, putting them, that what that does is that recruits more followers. So I've got two more people in the pews. And you know what? Jen was making a big deal about, hey, I've lost my only guy. Now she'll go on ahead and she'll put her twos and threes out. And she just got three people in the pews. So Jen, as it happens, can still go ahead and do her crusade by sending one of those guys along. Although Jen's used up almost all her dice. Now, I think what Jen's going to do is she's going to save these other dice for step five because she's going to send these monks out into the field to generate resources. But me, back to me, what am I going to do with the rest? So I've got another three here. I could get another follower or I could save this. Hmm. Now the other thing you can do, you can see these four, five, sixes go over here. I could put a four, five, and six. And that would, over, putting them over here increases my training. My, uh, you yeah. know, and I can work my way. Remember, I start as a simple monk. But if I do a four, five, six, I go beep, beep, beep. And I have now upgraded from a monk to a friar. And that gives me a permanent bonus for the rest of the game. But then that leaves me with only, but you know what? Actually, I could go like this and then I only get one guy. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to recruit one more guy. I'm going to save these, these threes to go out and harvest some stuff in the fields. And I'm going to put the four, five, and six over here. And so now I have a permanent bonus because I'm a friar for the rest of the game. I get plus two during the peasant phase, which I'll demonstrate in a little bit. So I think I'm done with my placement. I went off to the crusades. I recruited some more, you know, made our flock bigger. I trained myself to become a friar and I'm saving a couple of my monks. Okay, Jen, meanwhile, she recruited, she's recruiting two. Yeah, no, she recruited three, because, um, and then one of those three went off to the Crusades with three of her dudes. And she's not going to do any training. She's going to save this four and the six. Okay, so that's it. We are done with the first step three, Abbey Dice Placement. Now we move on to step four, purchase building cards. And they're over here, you can see. And you know they, uh, they increase in value. These ones cost two, these ones cost three, these ones cost four. And like through the ages, the ones that don't get bought, they eventually, over time, become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as we keep cycling through this. So I'm the first player, so I get first dibs. And, and basically, each player can buy, if they've got the money, up to two buildings. Although it works in... Um, for as the first player gets to buy one, then the second player, then the third player, and then, say if it was a three-player game, and then the third player could buy a second, then the second player, then the first player. So um, there's two rounds, one clockwise and one counterclockwise. But I'm the first, so I could buy any of these. Which ones am I thinking about? All right. So we've got... Ah, they're very far away. I've got to get in close. All right. So we got... Uh, ooh. Now, this requires two coin, two stone, and two sand to build. This chapter house, it's worth 10 points. And as soon as I buy this, um, which you know, if I pay two bucks, I immediately get two wood. If I buy this mortar's guild, which costs me two bucks, I'll immediately get two wood. So either way, I'll get two wood. But what do I want to do? Now, what I really want to do is what I'm concerned about. Oh, crap. I didn't think about Jen's defense at all. She, I think she's going to take one of these guys and put him on the wall. And so she's only going to save one guy for resource because you know, I mean, because we got we got that year of plenty, so we got a bunch of extra resources right off the bat. I forgot about that. So Jen's just going to put a guy in to make sure she does not fail uh, against the darkness. All right. So what I think I want to buy, I want to buy me a cloister. I already have one cloister. I'd like to get a second one. 
So because, well, first of all, I'll immediately get two wood for getting it. It costs three stone to build. I've got two stone. Um, yeah, I'm going to buy this. Remember, uh, so I'm going to pay three of my four starting bucks, and I'm going to buy this. And as soon as I buy it, I immediately get the reward, which is, you can see it's next to this lightning bolt, I get two more wood. Okay, so there we go. So I've got two wood. Right. Now, Jen could buy one or two buildings. She can buy one, and then she could buy another, and then I could buy another. Now, I've only got one more buck, so I can't buy any more anyway. Although, here's the interesting thing I, sh I should have mentioned. Both Jen and I get two opportunities over the course of the round to convert goods. I could use one of my opportunities and say, take this sand, which is worth five bucks, and convert it into five bucks. So I would have more money for more. I mean, you know, it's really, really cool that twice during a round, you get to do two conversions. So you have a lot of flexibility about how you're going to spend all your stuff. Anyway, I bought a cloister. Now, is Jen going to buy anything? Um, ba, 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 da, da. Now, Jen knows she needs one more defense. Um, or else, because she needs three and she's only got two. If she doesn't get one more defense, she's going to lose points and she'll lose one of her followers to the darkness. None of these other buildings we can get. I took the only one that can increase our defense. But there's other ways to increase defense. Jen, when it comes to building, she could build her own altar, which is two wood and four coins. And so that would get her the third defense she needs. Um, or if she wants to spend five stone, one, two, three, four, five, if she builds all the walls all the way around her abbey, she'll score eight points and a defense. And she needs to get that other defense since she didn't put a guy over here. <clears throat> but none of these buildings will help her get defense. So if she wants to get defense by building the altar, she has the two wood, but she needs four coins. And so if she spent, but again, she could convert something else to get more money. So I think she will. You know what? I think Jen is just going to pay all four bucks, and she's going to buy these two. She's going to buy the mortar guild and the charter house because they're the two cheapest things. All right. And now she immediately gets two wood and two wood. So Jen just got four more wood. One, two, three, four. So she is drowning in lumber, which is a more polite way of saying it. No wood jokes, everybody. Okay. So I bought one. Jen bought one. Then Jen gets to buy another one. Now I get to buy one more if I want. Now, I don't have enough money, but if I wanted, I could use one of my conversions to convert some of my other goods. Let's see. Now, to build this, I'm going to need three stone. I need to get one more stone. Now, I'm going to harvest stone with these guys, so I'm not too terribly worried about that. Um, but to, You know what? Actually, I'm not going to. I, I could buy one more building by converting some goods into money, but I'm not going to do that, so we're done. We have now finished the, um, what is it? the purchase building cards phase. Now, we move on to step five, resource and initiative selection. This is the other opportunity that we have to place our remaining guys. I've still got two guys to place. Jen's still got one. And we're going to place them out in the forest to get more lumber, in the fields to get wheat, in the quarry to get stone, or in the, uh, the sand pits to get sand. Okay. Now, I know I want to build this cloister, and I'm first. I, I'm still first player. So, <clears throat> let's see here. Yep, going to have to do it. I'm going to take both of my guys uh, and put them over here in the quarry. Now, normally you only get to place one guy at a time during this phase. So actually, I should say, what I'm really doing is, I'm placing one guy over here in the quarry. But since I'm the first one here, whenever you place, if there is a bonus space available, in, um, the first player to place gets first dibs on that bonus. So I'm going to go ahead and use the bonus as well. And it's in that way, by using these bonuses, that you... Now, I might not want to do that. I might have wanted to take this three and put it over someplace else. But as it is, I'm going to put it here in the bonus. Now, if I didn't... Jen would be able to place here and then take the bonus, but Jen only has one die left. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and take the bonus. That's my first placement. Now it's Jen's turn. She's got one more guy. Let's see, and I need to think about what she needs to build. She, okay, she wants to build her altar. She's got the two wood. She's, um, she, ha she doesn't have the money, so she's going to probably convert this sand into five bucks, so she'll be able to do that. But could she get one of these things built? Could she get the mortar guild built? Let's see, this, two coins, one wood, two stone. She's got the stone. She'd have the excess wood, but she'd need more money. So she could convert, say, some of her grain. Ah. Oh, but here's the other thing. Jen, to activate her garden, during harvest, she gets one grain for every three grain that's in her um, granary. She, she needs to have three grain or her garden won't um, be... Uh, won't produce. So I think Jen's going to take her action, and she's going to come over here 
to, into the fields to get some wheat. Now, the other thing Jen could interestingly do, she could, she could cut over here. There's, you can never get blocked out. You always have the opportunity to get stone, sand, um, grain, or lumber. Because there's one space available for every player. It's just a question of whether you can get there first and get the bonus space as well. Jen could also come over here to the initiative space. That means she would get one bonus chip. And we have no idea what this is. These can be very, very useful. And she would take first player. But Jen's not going to do that. She wants to get the food to ensure that her garden... Now, she could get the food by using another conversion to, say, convert some of this lumber. Oh. She could convert some lumber into wheat as well. Because, let's see, she's going to use, if she, all right, but she wants to convert some into coins, so she has enough to do the mortar skill. Let's see, actually, you know what, just to get this out of the way, I think Jen's going to, right now, while I'm thinking about all this, before Jen makes her placement, because you can do this conversion anytime you want, Jen's going to do one of her two conversions this round. And, let's see, she needs the stone to build the, the, the house. Uh, but here's the thing, the chapter house, Jen doesn't have to be in any particular rush to build this because all if she builds this and gets this manned, at the end of the game it's worth 10 points. That's it. So she doesn't have to rush on this, but as soon as Jen builds this, J stone can be purchased at 3 and traded at 4. So J stone becomes much more valuable if Jen can get this built early. To build this, she needs 2 coins, 1 wood, and 2 stone. So that means she I think she wants to keep her stone to be able to build this. She's going to use 2 wood over here. And so she needs 4 more coins, and she needs 1 wood. Right. And, and she knows she wants to make sure she has enough grain over here to activate her garden. So she's just thinking about how she wants to use all her stuff. So she is going to do her first conversion and take this sand that we got, thanks to the year of plenty, and she is going to convert sand into money. Sand has a value of five, so Jen just made five bucks. One, two, three, four, five. Arr, one, two, three, four, five. All right. Okay, so she's done one of her two conversions, but that's not enough. If she needs, uh, what's it? She need, all right. So she needs four coins over here. She needs another coin over here to build this mortars guild. So to get more money, well, you know what? She's going to do her other conversion as well. And uh, see, wood is worth two. She only needs one more buck, so she'll just give up one wood and get two more bucks. And that means she'll have enough. But you know what? What the heck? She'll she'll convert two while she's at it, just to get some more money. All right, just to make the most use. And now Jen cannot do any more swaps, but she's got enough to be able to build. She'll do quite a bit of building this round, okay. And now all of that was, you know, she was thinking about how she was gonna do all that because she still hasn't decided where to place her guy. She could go now and get some more wood to make up for all the wood she got rid of. Now what she'd like, to, she shouldn't go and get any stone because after she builds the mortar guild, she'll, wait, no, actually no. Her stone that she gets will be worth more than normal. But here's the thing. The resource generation is very much like Stone Age in that all these things have a resource or have a value. And so if Jen puts this six over here, she takes the six, divides by three, and that means she gets three wood. Or she could get two grain. Or she could get one stone or one sand, and you know, you don't get any kind of change. So Jen's gotta think, where is this six best used? I think she is going to put it over here, as originally planned, to get more grain so that she'll have enough to activate her garden. Okay. Now it's back to me. I don't have any more workers to place, so I'm pass. Jen has no more workers to place, so she passed. So we keep on doing this until... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there we go. Now we move on to sex. Now, moving peasants. This is the opportunity for the peasants we have in our church to work their way towards baptism. And... What everybody at this point, everybody gets one movement point. So Jen's going to spend her one movement point and move. Say she's going to move this peasant one step farther. When a peasant gets all the way to the front row, they become baptized. So Jen's on her way. And the thing is, you need to have a peasant be, to be baptized before they can work in a building. So that's an important consideration. All righty. So, Jen's um, moved her peasants. Now, here's the interesting thing. Like I said, at the beginning of the game, everybody gets one move. So, you saw Jen do one move. Because I have upgraded a friar, I get three moves. So, my one guy, I'm going to move him one, two, three, and boom, he's been baptized just like that. It, until Jen becomes a friar, it's going to take her a while to get baptized workers who she can put to work in her buildings. This guy started baptized, but okay. So, anyway, so that, that was step five. The move peasant step. Wow, and we're at an half an hour already. And I'm only halfway through. You know what? 
You know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right before step seven, the build. When we build all the stuff, we've got all these resources, we're going to want to build our things. Then we harvest, we feed our people, then we come by the darkness, then we collect income, then we um, you know, deal with the crusades, and then we set up. So if you would like to see all the rest of this stuff, because you ain't seen nothing yet, the game just keeps on building. There's a lot more stuff to see. You can hit, the, and plus I'll probably play through at least one more full round. I'll play through the second round as well. You can hit the button that's on screen or follow the show notes to go to the extended playthrough, or you can go to the final thoughts. Alternatively, in five, four, three, two, one.